Okay, quick question. How many of you like to play Monopoly? How many of you like to play Monopoly? Okay, not, uh, how many of you know what is, don't know what is Monopoly? Should know, right? You should know, right? Well, for me, I absolutely hate playing Monopoly. Okay, why? Because when I was a kid, when, when I was first introduced to Monopoly as a kid, I was traumatized. Okay, the traumatized is the right word, okay? Because the whole game was about accumulating wealth, right? As much wealth as you can, as many property as you can, and the, ga- the aim of the game is to monopolize the whole economy board, right? The board, the board. And I remember when I was a very young kid, uh, I was playing with my friends and uh, playing with some of my cousins. And as I was playing, I, I looked into their eyes. And throughout the whole game, all I can see were dollar signs. Right? And as the game progresses, oh, I remember I was just, I'm one of those who are uh, very unlucky, very lousy or whatever it is. But I, I find myself every round trying to just get to go. Right? So that I can collect the measly $200 and uh, survive one more round. And as the game progresses, you start to see people form alliance, right? All the alliances start to form because why? They don't want anybody to come out top, right? They, oh, they start to form alliances and worse still, if you happen to be the one who very early in the game established yourself as number one, or oh, you are the one that very gung-ho, right? Buy all the property, right? I always want to buy all the most expensive places, the blue color, right? Dark blue ones, uh, you know, right? I always buy the brown one. Uh, the Singapore version, Geylang, I don't know what, what a lousy place is. Right, and, and if, you, if you are the one who comes out top very early in the game, you know what will happen? They will all gang up on you, right? They will form alliance and they will say, hey, we don't collect rent from each other, just take from him, right? Until finally you become bankrupt, right? You will never win. And then the final, final phase of the game, some guy will secretly, slyly, buy up all the properties. Say, hey, no money, never mind, give me your title deed. And then at the end, he will come up top and devilishly laugh at everybody because he managed to con everyone and become Mr. Monopoly. Right, the pressure to accumulate wealth in the form of cash and property that you experience in a game of Monopoly, you know how it turns people into these self-centered, unscrupulous, opportunistic frenemies. Okay, it somewhat re- represents how, what we experience in life. Right? All, all of us face that kind of financial pressure, that kind of financial stress to try to make it, to accumulate, or just to make ends meet. Right? Like me, trying to roll the dice to make it to go. Some of us, we live from paycheck to paycheck, right? trying to just pay the monthly bills and to make ends meet because of all the things that uh, we, have, we just have to be responsible for. And some people, they are well-to-do, but they always feel that they are not doing too well. Right? Some are always worried about their financial security, no matter how much they earn. And the question is, what causes this financial pressure and stress? How do we find relief? If you have been following financial gurus, okay, uh, all the people who write books, right? and uh, in this day especially, you know YouTube, they always pop up on YouTube ads. Right? I know YouTube is very, very frustrating, very irritating, because they want you to sign up for YouTube Premium. You see, another financial pressure <laughs> to get you to sign on. So I, I hate it, right? But you always see these financial gurus pop up and say, oh, you know, I found out, discovered this way to earn money. Uh, this is how you can join to the e-commerce game and all these kind of things. Right? Some of these financial gurus, maybe their strategies, their, their, their tips, they work. Okay? But they don't adequately address the deeper motivation and give us an answer for true relief. So where do we find the help? Well, thank God, because God has given us the best wealth management manual in the world, and that is the Bible. Now you might think, huh, pastor, Bible. If you're a non-Christian, then it's like, what? Really, in the Bible? Yes, in the Bible. Okay, that's why you need to read your Bibles, right? If you study the Bible carefully, okay, you notice the words money, gold, silver, wealth, riches, inheritance, debt, poverty, and all the related topics. Okay, you put them all together, you realize that the Bible pays more attention to financial matters than any other topics. In fact, Jesus himself talked more about money than any other subject when he was on earth during his ministry. Why? Well, because contrary to popular belief, God isn't against us having wealth or against us having money. Throughout the Bible, you see that God has blessed and prospered many people. He worked through the rich to further his kingdom's purposes. 
right? It was, it's just interesting when you read through the Gospels itself, you will know that many of the things that Jesus did, right? Many of the things that he, even during his journeys, there were rich people who funded his ministry work. Just go ahead and read, right? And so what we need to understand about God and finances is this. God isn't against us having money, but money having us. Okay, I'll say that once more. God isn't against us having money, but money having us. And today, I'm going to share with you the three causes of financial pressure and stress in our life. Okay, we're going to look at a, a letter written by the Apostle Paul to his most beloved disciple, Timothy. Okay, he has uh, left Timothy to pastor the church in Ephesus. And so he wrote him some letters to encourage him, give him some ideas what to do, and all that kind of thing. So in the first letter, in the final part, before he signs off, he wrote about wealth. He touched on a topic on wealth, right, and how to respond to it. Okay, and as we look at this portion of the letter, I just want to share with you the three C's of financial pressure and stress. The first C, the first cause of financial pressure and stress is comparison. Okay, turn to somebody and say, comparison. You see, when we compare with others, okay, we notice the gap. Okay, we, and we let that affect our moods. It affects the way we think about our financial status and our identity. Right? We, we, when we swipe through our Facebook posts, our Instagram posts, and you see the things that our friends, you know, the fancy things that they buy, right? the latest things that they have upgraded to, the fine dining food, the umakase that they eat, right? or the, I don't know, I have never had umakase before. I don't even know what's that. Right? Uh, I think it's just short of people putting food into your mouth or huh? something like that. Okay, <laughs> anyway. Or the exotic places that they go. Of course, in today's COVID world, you cannot go anywhere, right? So they compare uh, which hotel you go for staycation, uh, which, uh, which cruise line you go for your cruise, because even between cruises, there is a ranking, right? And when we look at all these things, when we see the gap, we feel lousy about ourselves, right? We feel pressurized and stressed. You see, not because we don't have enough, we feel pressurized and stressed because we see others having more. It makes us feel small and worthless. And I vividly remember um, this feeling, this deep sense of loss, this deep sense of dejection uh, after one year of working. Okay, I started, uh, I came into full-time ministry immediately after graduating from NUS. Okay, so uh, after a year of working, my batchmates decided that, hey, we should have a mini reunion dinner. Let's meet up and catch up. I said, sure. So we met at Lao Pasat okay, to have dinner. Okay, and so we were happily chatting, having dinner, and I was my usual self, very happy, joking, talking very loudly. And then somebody, some joker, decided that we should talk about finance, our, our salary. Wow, immediately my, my face changed. Right? And they started to talk about our salary. They went one round. They said, hey, let's go one round and share how much you earn. So, are, you serious? are you serious or not? So, okay, okay. Then they went around. And then this guy, he was super enthusiastic because why? He was sharing with us that, wow, we just one year, uh, my pay jumped by 40%, you know. It's like, wow, 40%. I think mine is 0.4%. Maybe you don't even have. Right? And they went one round and they, and they came to me and said, hey, so what about you? How much do you earn? I was like, wow. Oh. Immediately, my tone became more mellow. My volume dropped a lot, almost like a whisper. I told them how much I earn. And then I started to qualify myself. Ah, yeah, you know, non-profit is like that one. You know, don't expect too much. La. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I try to comfort myself. I say, you know, I'm doing a most meaningful work. I'm serving God full time. I'm storing up treasures in heaven. But honestly, I felt so small inside. <laughs> right? And they just kept quiet because... They're all non-Christians, so they don't understand, right? And I thought, back then, so reflecting on it, I thought I was pursuing God in my career. But in that moment, I realized I fall into the same trap, right? That I'm actually wondering how much gold can I accumulate in, the, in my career? And maybe for some of you, in some form, today, you are experiencing this as well. So what does Paul say about all this? Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 to 8. He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. You see, the relief to the pressure and stress caused by comparison is to learn to be content. How do we be content? Well, not like the way our parents taught us to be content. You know how our parents used to teach us to compare with others some more? 
right? You see, compared to people worse off than you, then you'll feel better about yourself. I remember when I was young, my mother always, or my grandmother always liked to say, uh, better finish your food, if not, the people in Africa know food. Then I always retort, then send the food to Africa, lah. Right? And I realized I also fall into that same uh, thinking of comparison. When we were in Cambodia, I remember one day we were uh, taking a, the tuk-tuk right, to, the, to, to somewhere and we, it was raining, or post-rain, still a bit of drizzle. And we saw some children, okay, I think they, they belong to the, the urban slums. Okay, they were like naked or just in the underwear playing in the dirty water by the riverside. And I was telling Zach, my son, I said, boy, you must learn to be grateful. Right? You must be grateful that God has blessed you all these things and be generous to share with people. Look at those children. They are so poor thing. We must learn to share with others what we have. You know, because he was whining and grumbling about the toys and all this kind of nonsense, right? And I was like, oh, I'll talk more about it next week, okay? So come back next week for child raising, okay? And so, and so I realized that I also fall into the same trap. But the truth is this, when we compare with others, even in this manner, we don't learn to be content. And... That is why Paul tells us right, that the way to, be real, to, to realistically go about this is to recognize that we came into this world with nothing. Right? We came as a baby, naked with nothing, and we will leave this world bringing nothing with us as well. That is our starting and ending point. You see, if we understand this, if we internalize this, then we will see everything in between as a blessing and an enjoyment. That's why Paul can say, if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Right? That is how we achieve the true contentment and overcome the urge to compare. In fact, the wealthiest man in the Old Testament, King Solomon, he, he was blessed with great wealth, but also great wisdom to observe life. And he made this observation in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10. He says this, Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is, is meaningless. And isn't that very true? If money has a grip on us, right? If money has a hold on us, we will never learn to be content no matter how much you earn. No matter how high your income goes, you will never be satisfied because you will always be comparing with someone who's earning more than you and trying to match up with them. As Solomon says, this too is a meaningless pursuit. Turn to somebody and say, it's meaningless to compare. And Jesus, of course, warns us about greed. He says this in Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possession. You see, when we, when we buy into this comparison trap, when we fall into this comparison trap, greed sets in. And it causes us to think that life consists in an abundance of possessions. We depend on our possessions to feel secure about ourselves. We depend on our possessions to feel good about ourselves. And even when we actually do have enough to live comfortably and securely, we feel stressed when we see others having more than us. So the solution is to learn to be content and to see that, you know, even if you just have a roof over your head and food to eat, you are enough. And everything else will be considered a blessing to enjoy because godliness with contentment is great gain. Okay, turn to somebody and say, don't compare. Okay, that's, the first, that's the first cause, right? The second cause of financial pressure and stress is carelessness. Okay, it's carelessness. Now, a lot of us think that uh, we, we are very careful with our money. Stinginess is not carefulness. Okay, just saying, okay? if we are counting every cent and dollar, that's not being careful, that's being stingy. Okay? Let's look at what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. Okay? Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and to many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, another effect caused by money having a hold of us is that we become careless in the way we manage our wealth. You see, a lot of financial stress is actually self-induced. It's preventable. It's usually the result of poor money management. We simply don't manage our wealth prudently. Right? We get tempted and foolishly fall into traps that lead us to ruin and destruction. For example, some people who are not experienced 
traders. Okay, they got themselves burned investing in high-risk investment instruments. Right, back in the day when I was a kid and, my, uh, uh, and our parents, my parents, well, my mom was working uh, and all that, that era where people were trading, right? They were into all the invest, the stocks and all these kind of things. And I remember back then, right, people uh, hearing from her about like, how her colleagues are stressed about uh, stocks and all these kind of things. That was the era. Today's equivalent, I think it will be trading in uh, things like cryptocurrency. Okay, I'm not saying that you cannot do it. And I'm not saying that it's bad to do it. Okay? I'm saying that if you're not experienced, if you're not an experienced trader, okay, don't just go with what people say and jump into it right? and get yourself burned. Some of us, okay, some people live on credit to acquire possessions, to enjoy and feel good about themselves, only to feel stress you know, by trying, having to make the monthly minimum payment on their credit card bills. Many people, in fact, buy things on impulse, Shopee, right? When your Shopee alert or the Lazada app, right, appears on your phone, like just now, just halfway through the sermon, or a notification come out, give away, voucher, right? You know, swipe, 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 and you start buying, right? And many people buy things on impulse. We end up spending uh, beyond our means, or accumulating things that we don't really need. I think, I think, as a as a as a guy, I know, okay, we are very susceptible to buying uh, cheap things. Right? Cheap gadgets, electronics. Oh, yeah, so cute. Uh, this one, uh, uh, this wire, 50 cents only, $1 only. Oh, this combo pack, well, not bad. Uh, 150 can redeem some coin, just buy. Right? And we, we just buy, 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 put add to cut, add to cut. Finally, the bill is like more than what our uh, wife spent. Right? <laughs> one, one of my favorite childhood movies, okay? Has this theme song. It goes like this. Right? Do you know this song? Do you know what movie it comes from? Chen Pu Goyong, right? If you, if you know this, if you don't know this show, you are too young. Okay, for those who are old and don't know this song, it's a compliment, okay? It's, a, it's from the movie Chen Pu Goyong, Money Know Enough, right? And it's by the local director Jack Neo. Okay, this is one of the Singapore's top grossing Singaporean film, you know, of all time, until A Boys to Men came. Okay, so if you have not watched it before, and uh, you want to rewatch it, it's on Netflix. Okay, so don't say I bought you, lah, right? Good deal, my share, okay? <laughs> Good deal, my share. Now, this story is about three Singaporeans, right? Uh, three Singapore friends and their, their desire for money, right? They pursue money differently, okay? And eventually, it wrecked their lives, it wrecked their friendship. And the show humorously gives us insight on how the love for money causes us to be careless in the way we manage our wealth, okay? Which leads to financial pressure and stress that ruins our life and relationships, and so the solution, what's the solution? The solution to find relief in this area is to seek wisdom, right? Seek wealth and financial wisdom. Okay? In fact, as I said in the beginning, the Bible is full of such wisdom. When I, when I was thinking about this show, one wisdom that came to mind uh, comes from Proverbs. And it speaks exactly to one of the characters. He, he had to borrow uh, money from loan sharks. Okay, and of course, uh, to, in today's equivalent, we don't have that kind of illegal loan sharks, right? Our equivalent is the Singapore debt collector. Right? If you read the news about nice, it's not very nice, right? So in Proverbs chapter 22, there's this wisdom, it says this, Do not be one who shakes hands in pledge or puts up security for debts. If you lack the means to pay, your very bed will be snatched from under you. Thousands of years ago, we already tell you, don't borrow money from Along. Right, from the loan sharks. Don't be careless and get into bad debt or have dealings with bad debtors. I say it this way. If you care less about how you manage your money, then you'll have less money to care about. Okay, if you care less about how you manage your money, then you have less money to care about. So if you need good financial advice, don't talk to me. Right? Go and talk to people who have a good track record of handling their wealth, especially those who are godly and generous. Okay, for those in the family zone, you know who I'm talking about. I never say who, right? You just uh, assume. They could be your cell group leaders and your pastors. Right? When you ask them to meet you and say, Pastor, leader, uh, CJL, I would like to meet you to talk about my financial situation, I'm sure they will avail themselves to talk to you. Or... If you want to be savvy in maximizing your finances, go and talk to our humble and godly wealth management gurus, Brother Chi Ming, Banda, and Loyal from the Brighton Adult Zone. 
Okay, this morning when I shared it, I was looking around for them, I realized, hey, they're all second service. <laughs> okay, so I mentioned them because I attended the Brighter Adults webinar okay, on personal finance, and I thought it was really uh, insightful. So talk to people with their good track record who are godly and generous. You see, the Bible has a lot to say about money. And it has a lot to say, a lot of warning about, about this. Because why? Carelessness and foolishness in managing our money can be easily prevented. Can you turn to somebody and say it can be prevented? We just need to put in effort to pay attention to our spending habits and to learn from wise counsel and apply their advice. And I'm not even talking about trying to get rich. Okay, I'm just talking about being prudent, having some basic care about how you manage your money so that you can avoid or reduce the stress that you're facing in the area of finance. And if you're a Christian who wants to truly experience financial breakthrough and live your life with, uh, according to God's purpose, then you will do well to heed Jesus' advice. Okay, he says this in Luke chapter 16, Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? God is not against us having money, but against money having us. And one of the effects of that is that we become callous and untrustworthy with whatever wealth God has entrusted to us. The way we handle our money not only affects our life externally, it also reflects what goes on on the inside of us. Okay, and this leads me to the final C. Okay, the third cause of financial pressure and stress in our life comes from us putting our confidence in wealth rather than in God. Right? Where we put our trust, our confidence in wealth rather than in God. Let's finish the letter in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 onwards. He says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Now, I hope when you read these final words of Paul, it will confirm for you, it will affirm you that God isn't against us having money. Right? That we, I just want to assure somebody next to you, okay? Say, God isn't against you having money. Okay, I hope you help, it helps you to recognize that God gave us money as a means to enjoy the life He has given to us and to do the work that He has entrusted to us. Right? That is the purpose of money. But why has it become such a big stress in our life? Because we end up valuing money more than God. We end up putting our security and confidence in wealth. We think that if we have it, we will be truly happy and all our problems will go away. But in reality, it's a lie, right? Money takes, con well, our wealth takes control of our life, yet it never gives us that true security that we seek. And however much you have, you'll always feel insecure in your life if you put your confidence in wealth. And so Jesus warns us about this, about putting our confidence in wealth as a source of our security. In Matthew chapter 16, he says this, Whatever good will, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Right? When you give everything, to put everything into the pursuit of wealth, right, you lose your soul. You do not become more secure. You become more insecure. You see, money is a blessing. It is meant to be used and it's meant to be shared. Money itself is not evil. It is amoral. But our attachment to money and our worship of money will lead us into sin and making poor financial decisions that cause all the unnecessary stress in life. So what's the solution? It is to put our confidence in God instead. Turn to somebody and say, put your confidence in God. It is to return to God as a source of your money and your true identity. See, that is how you find true relief from financial pressure and stress. You see, Paul's command, I just, you can just sum it up as this. Paul's command to us is this. In this life, 
enjoy your money. Right? Firstly, enjoy your money. Secondly, share it with others. And thirdly, use it to store up treasures in heaven. Right? Use it to store up treasures in the next life. Okay? The, the author of Hebrews encourages us with this. He says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. That is how we shift from putting our confidence in wealth to having a confidence in God. When we can trust in what God said. And we do that by looking to the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, the cross of Jesus Christ tells us that we were the ones who first rejected God. We were the ones who rebelled against God. We said, God, you know, maybe you are not the source of my wealth. I'm the source of my wealth. I'm a self made man, right? Because of my, in, of my work, because of how capable I am, I'm so wealthy, right? Because I'm able to trade at the right time, buy and sell. That's why I'm so wealthy. We reject God as a source of security. We think that our money will keep us secure, right? We just need to buy the, the, uh, the necessary insurance plans and we'll be okay, right? We just need to diversify our investments so that, you know, no matter what happens, what kind of financial crisis, whatever bubble bursts, I will be okay, Right? And, when we, and because we do that, we depend on our wealth. But God, even though He knows that we were the ones who caused our own problems, get all tangled up with all this uh, stress, God took the first step to reconcile with us. Right? He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to come and redeem and rescue us. When Jesus came to earth as a man to die on the cross for our sins, He gave up His heavenly riches and became poor so that we may become rich and share in His heavenly inheritance as children of God. That is who we are, and that is what we have. See, and that is how we know for sure that if God did not even withhold His one and only Son, that we can be sure He will never leave us nor forsake us. And that is how we can turn to God and put our confidence in God and not our wealth. And what will happen when we do that? If we put our confidence in, in God and not in our wealth, then we will not worship wealth, but we will worship with our wealth. Right? We will not be enslaved by our wealth, but be free to enjoy it. We will be able to share with others and willingly, generously help those who are in financial need. In fact, we will learn to live simply so that others may simply live. When we experience success in our finances, we will recognize that we have been blessed to be a blessing that God is releasing His resources for His kingdom's purposes through us. Right? We can enjoy it, of course. You can buy that Gucci bag. Nobody is stopping you. But it's not meant only for our enjoyment. It is for the gospel's advancement. And when we live like this, then we will take hold of the life that is truly life. Amen? And now on the flip side, when we face financial lack, where we are in a financial crisis, right? especially in the past year with COVID, a lot of people lose their jobs. Right? When that happens, we will not feel lousy about ourselves and hide away from people because of shame or feel that feeling of inadequacy. Because our worth is not tied to our net worth. And we will not despair because we know that God is our security and our provider. We can trust that God will provide for us through any means and especially through the community of His people here in Brighton Community Church. Amen? You see, God uses us as His channels of blessing. Right? He releases His resources through the church. And I just want to affirm you, assure you, encourage you that when you put your confidence in God and not in wealth, then you will not let it affect your identity and your sense of worth. You will be able to seek help from people, from your brothers and sisters in Christ, from your family here. And you will get the help that you truly need. We begin to see God at work in our lives differently. We see God at work through the lives of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? Now, may I have the worship team to join me on stage? You see, money in this life, let me go back to my Monopoly story, okay? Money in this life is like Monopoly, Okay? Once the game is over, it has no value. However much you accumulate, I will throw you at your face. Right? However uh, many property, what red, color, red hotel or greenhouse you have, is meaningless, worthless. Right? But how you make the money, what you do with the money, 
and how you treat people throughout the game will determine what happens in the life after. My, my favourite movie quote comes from the movie Gladiator. And he says, what we do in life echoes in eternity. Okay, and he applies to the way we manage our finances as well. To my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, okay, today I just want to urge you to return to God as your source of money and security. See, recognise that all your wealth, everything that you have, comes from God and it is for His kingdom's purposes. Of course you get to enjoy it, but that is not the main purpose. Right? We are mere stewards of God's riches. So give it to Him freely. Give it to others freely. And don't be worried that you'll never have enough because God, who has not withheld even His Son from you, who has promised that He will never leave you nor forsake you, He will provide for you, right? Even in the area of financial provision. And I want to encourage those of you who are facing financial difficulties right now. Okay, maybe you are in transition, a job. Maybe you are not sure how long this current contract will last, what happens after. Okay, wherever you are, you know, in whichever stage of it and you are facing that stress and pressure because of your finances I want to encourage you to come and talk to us talk to your leaders talk to your cell group be vulnerable with your spiritual family because that's what we are here for Amen? That's what we are here for to be channels of God's provision in our time of need Yes, when you pray in your private room in your closet in your, you know, and ask God to provide for you. Usually we think of it as, well, maybe a, a job opening will suddenly open up. Yes, maybe. But maybe it will come through the recommendation of your fellow cell group member. Right? Maybe your fellow cell group members will help you tight through this season as you wait for a job opening. You never know. But a lot of times, because we put our confidence in our wealth, we feel ashamed. We feel that our worth is tied to our net worth and we don't dare to ask people for help. Right? We don't dare to be vulnerable and share with our cell group members. And we just go at it alone. But that is not the life that God wants us to live. Right? He wants us to live a life, truly take hold of life that is truly life, to experience the abundant life. Right? The abundant life is more than just money, more than just the things, the branded things we wear and the holidays that we have. The abundant life is experienced through the presence of God working in our lives through our brothers and sisters who are on the same journey with us. And to those of you who are not yet believers, the truth is this. Okay, I, just like last week, let me be very blunt. You will never escape the pressure and stress of real-life monopoly unless you are able to have money but not let it have you. And the only way to do that is to acknowledge that God is the source of all wealth and God is the only source of true security. And all you have to do is to invite Jesus into your life as your God, as your Lord, the master of your life and ask Him to guide you, change you in the way you look at wealth, in the way you manage your wealth. And this afternoon, now it's afternoon, I want to give you an opportunity. If today, if there's any one of you who wants to put your trust in Jesus Christ, and say that I want to change the way I think about my wealth, my, my money, and my, my, my source of security, and I want Jesus. Then I want to give you an opportunity to invite Jesus into your life today. 